are you? That's not.
I'm worried when my wife says you're sick. Oh, you're such a great guy. You make people like me feel so good. service of the night. It's an opportunity for people who didn't make it on the weekends or, or even for people that did and just want a different experience. We uh, do some unplugged worship and Dixie usually leads that with us, which is great. And uh, we've got words around on the tables for you if you want to follow along. We really encourage you to. You know, worship is not just music, uh, but worship uh, can include music, but worship is saying that God is worthy. And so part of how we do that is coming into God's presence and uh, being able to pray and say the things to God uh, that are on your heart and where you are. And uh, so, you know, we, we can do that in these songs. And so whether you know the song or not, it's an opportunity for you to come into the presence of God and to be able to pray and to sing these songs because what they all these songs do is they say... Is worthy, and that's who he is, um, and so that's part of what we're doing tonight, we want to encourage you to do that, and so we'll have a couple different things, and then after we have some time for some music, uh, we'll have an opportunity to uh, talk about a few different topics, and one of the topics I really want to talk about tonight is a topic that has been on my mind since yesterday, and uh, it's really what Travis hit on yesterday, and that is a topic of surrender, uh, and it's a hard topic. So, uh, at least I think, the topic of surrender, what does it look like, what does it mean in my life in relationship to God, in my relationship with God, what does surrender really look like, uh, and um, how does it work. And so we're going to deal with that, and then if we've got some time, and I think we will, then uh, we'll have an opportunity for you to ask whatever question you want, and I'll do my best to field it uh, on the spot, and if I don't know, then I'll make something up. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I just have to keep you on your toes. If I don't know, I'll go, that's a great question. Let's talk about it next week. Uh, or if we don't have time, I'll do the same thing. So. so that's what we're here tonight to do. This idea of the well comes right out of the Bible. It's out of John 4, where the woman comes to the well for water. And she meets Jesus there. And Jesus, um, instead of just giving her the water that she's looking for, he offers her living water. And so hopefully that's what this will be for you, and you know, you may have come for various reasons, maybe you just were bored and you didn't have anything else to do tonight, and uh, that's possible, and you came here for that, but hopefully what you get out of it is living water, or maybe you came here uh, because the coffee's really good, and instead you get living water, and so that's what we're here to do, hopefully that's what you'll find tonight, and so I want to pray, and then let's get started with some music. Father God, we praise you for who you are, and you are good and awesome in every way. I thank you for giving us time tonight, which is one of the most valuable things that we have in our lives right now, is time. And it always seems like it's hard to find it, to do anything. And so I'm thankful for those that are here, that are willing to take time to come and be in your presence. And we invite you here now, and ask that you would move in this place, move in our hearts. Because God, we want to leave here tonight and not be the same as we were when we came in, but that something will change in us, something will transform in us, and that we really will be different. And so God, that's what I pray for. I pray that you will move and do that now in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Oh, 
is, is that each time we are together, that uh, we see that love from you. And I pray that it's not just when we come together in this place, that's important, but I pray that each day when we wake up in the morning, that we understand how much you do truly love us. Because I know, Father, that when we understand how you love us, it will change the way that we see the world. It will change the way that we see ourselves. It will change the way that we function and think and see and hear and move when we know that you, the one who spoke heavens and earth into existence, loves us. That your back's not turned, that you're not far off, but you're here now near us. God, we have seen that love displayed. Each one of us, no matter our circumstances, no matter our upbringing or where we've been, we've seen that love from you. And I pray that we will see it more and more and more. That we will see that love from you more and more in our lives. We'll experience it. It would be palpable in our lives that we would understand it more and more. And so, Father, we pray that our eyes would be open to who you really are. And that we'll experience it in a greater way tonight. Jesus. One of the greatest ways that uh, we understand the love of God is uh, by what he did for us at the cross. It, that is one of those things, um, and truly it's the greatest thing that separates uh, our God from any others that claim to be God. There is no such thing as someone else that would be willing to give up their life. No other deity would give up their life for the creation or for the loyal subjects. But we see in our God that he gives up, uh, and we'll talk about that tonight, but gives up uh, the ability to uh, function as most of us would think that he should. Most of us would assume that God would be high on a throne, far unreachable from any of us, but yet God takes on flesh and walks among us and ultimately dies in a place. That's an amazing thing. And I think if we were to, you know, if we didn't have the Bible and someone were to tell that story, it would, hard, it would be hard to believe, wouldn't it? That God would take on flesh and walk among us and, and die in our place so that we could be set free of something. It's hard to understand. But when we understand, even in what we can comprehend as humans, in our ability or willingness to give up our life for a child, we begin to get a picture of what that sacrifice would look like. And I think most of us, if, if you're a parent, you can kind of catch at least a, a piece of that idea and the willingness to do whatever it would take to save your child, including give up your life. When we understand it that way, I think we can begin to understand what God was willing to do for us and what he did do. He takes on flesh and he walks on us and he dies on the cross to make a way for us to be free of sin, to pay the penalty of our sin so that we can eventually one day be with Him. And so we celebrate that tonight, and, and uh, we celebrate it every day. I hope it's something you think about, just like I, as I pray, that you would each day as you wake up in the morning, your eyes would see differently because you understand what God's willing to do for you. And so you're invited to do that tonight, to remember the body and the blood of Jesus, to take in a communion, if that's something you want to do. We make it available, you don't have to do it. But we make it available because it's the only thing that we, it's the only place in the Bible I see uh, where Jesus asks us to remember him in a certain way. It's the only way is in this communion. And so we do that to remember what Christ did. And so you're invited to do that tonight. And so we're going to have, uh, I'm going to pray and have a few minutes of silence. There's a couple of places over here and here if you want to share in that communion. Take a piece of bread and take a cup and eat that bread and remember the body that was broken. Just drink that cup, cup and remember the blood that was shed. And uh, you're invited to do that as we sing another song or two tonight before we get started with our study. So let's pray. God, we thank you for this most amazing thing that is truly hard to comprehend that you would be willing to die in our place. So I pray that our eyes would really be open to that and what that really means, what it looks like, how we can comprehend it more and more as we walk through this life. But God, it means everything. And if Christ had not died for us, we would surely be lost. And of course, if 
he hadn't risen from the dead, we would have no hope. But we thank you for that, and we remember it, and we take time to remember it, because it's the most important thing that Christ died for us. So I pray that our eyes would be open, just like those that were on their way to Emmaus. Eventually their eyes were open to who Jesus was as he shared that meal with them. That's my hope, that our eyes would be open to who you are. In Jesus' name. you
We have lots of different scriptures that talk about surrender. And I just want to hit a couple of these. And so, like, for instance, if you go to Proverbs chapter 23, I think we see an example of surrender. I like how the English Standard Version reads better on this passage. <coughs> but we, we can handle it okay with a different passage. But Proverbs chapter 23, verse 26 says, Give me your heart, my son, and let your eyes delight in my ways. Now you might read that and not think that's a surrender passage, but if you listen to it closely, Give me your heart, son. That, that's an issue of surrender, to give your heart uh, back to God. Give me your heart and let your eyes delight in my ways. Which part of that, to me, when I read that passage in Proverbs, means not only am I going to relinquish what I want, I'm not, not only am I going to let go and hand over, but I'm going to do it with a happy heart. That's kind of what that says to me. Let your eyes delight in my ways. We can, do, we can relinquish a couple different ways. Would you agree? We can relinquish kicking and screaming. In other words, if you were to say, I am going to force you to give this up because you have to do it. You have to do it. Eventually, you know, we'll let go and hand it over, but it might be one of those, you can, you know, pry my cold dead fingers off, right? That's not a willing relinquishing, but sometimes we relinquish that way. Would you agree? Have there been any areas in your life where God has said, it's time to give it up, and you relinquished it like that? It's like, God, okay, but you're going to have to peel my fingers off. Because I don't want it, but I know I have to, but I'm not happy about it. Anybody ever been there? I have. Several times. Could probably tell lots of stories. You may never come back if you were to listen to my stories. I mean, that's just how it goes. We all have those stories where it's like, i got to give this up, but I don't want it. But you get a passage like Proverbs 23 and 26. It says, give me your heart, which, by the way, you hear us talk about a lot. It's not about just doing the right things. It's not giving it up because I'm just checking off a box. It's giving it up because I'm supposed to give it up. I'm giving it up because of my heart. I want to be in tune with God. And then that passage after it says, and let your eyes delight my ways, which means find a way to be happy about it. And that's challenging. We'll talk about it more. I think that's one of the hardest parts. You see other places, like in Psalms, the book before that. Look over at Psalms chapter 46 and 10. You get another picture, I think, of what surrender looks like. Psalm 46 and 10 uh, says that this is, you now this reads different ways in different Bibles, but I like what my New American Standard says. Cease striving and know that I'm God. Now that's a popular one that most of us have memorized, whether you're used to church or not. And that is, be still and know that I'm God. I am terrible at this one, by the way. This is why it's hard to talk about these topics, because I struggle with some of these. Being still, I'm not a good be still guy. I am a little ADD. I have to move. I like to move. I like to work. I like to do stuff. And being still is hard for me. And here's the thing, though. I figured out that um, I've got a couple of choices in my life. I can either choose to be still, or God could do something to help me be still. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I don't want God to have to take me to class to figure out how to be still. I need to work at it as a discipline, a spiritual discipline, to be still, to take time, breathe, and process and think. Like, it's hard for me sometimes to sit down. I get sidetracked easy. Squirrel, you know, that kind of thing. Like, I sit down, squirrel, and read my Bible, and it's like, ooh, yeah, I like that. i got to take a note. And then I'm off doing something else. Like, ooh, I can use that in a sermon. And that's why my Bible looks like this. And I've got these things and cliff notes and, you know, the first, like, two books don't attach anymore. Um, that kind of stuff. It's because it's like, ooh, yeah, I like that, and I want to go here, here, and here. And I gotta, sometimes I've got to read it and just go, okay, now, shut up. Spencer. Be still. Focus, be still. It's hard to do sometimes. But it is an issue of surrender to be still. Or as the New American Standard, which I really like better, even though be still and know that I'm God is really good, because when you're freaking out, that be still and know that I'm God is helpful and it's good. But the cease striving, which is, I sort of picture like, quit trying so hard to climb this rope or whatever, cease striving and know that God's there. And it's challenging. 
And there's lots of other ones. I'll, I'll give you one New Testament one. Look over at the book of Luke. That way I'm well-rounded here. We'll go Luke. Luke chapter 9, verses 23 and 24. Here's what it says. And he was saying to them all, this is Jesus talking, If anyone wants to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake, he is the one who will save it. Um, that is one of the harder passages in the Bible. It is usually the passage that most people attribute to this phrase called the cost of discipleship, which is to follow is, doesn't mean it's always easy. And sometimes what it really is is taking up our cross. And taking up our cross in our society... Uh, is probably different than when Jesus was talking about taking up your cross and being willing to literally die uh, for the sake of the message of Christ. Most of us aren't asked to do anything near that. Sometimes we go, okay, is my cross that I've got to, you know, uh, go out and do something in the, you know, out in war? Is that my cross? You know, that kind of thing. Uh, and so the question is, is, what does that look like? And and we could spend easy we can spend an hour just talking about those two verses. And I don't want to because I don't want to get sidetracked too much on it. Uh, but the reality is it's a hard passage and I challenge you to deal with it. I do. I just challenge you to write it down, Luke 9, 23 and 24, and just chew through it and work through it. But as far as surrender, it's part of that idea of being willing to take up your cross and follow. Follow in general is part of that idea of surrender, which is exactly what discipleship is. If you've listened to me a while and you've been here for a while, you know you've heard me define disciple partly in the idea of walking in the footsteps of Christ and doing what he did and moving that direction is part of disciple. And of course, Jesus says several times, follow me, and this is one of them, which means don't sort of do it your own way, follow me. And so that is part of the challenge of surrender. But we see it all throughout. Just shoot out names for me. Who are some of the characters in the Bible, Old Testament or New, that we really see exhibiting surrender in their lives? Joshua. Joshua, good. And just explain why, just real quick. Joshua said, where, if you're not there, I'm not going. Okay, there you go. That's fair. Good. What else? Job. Job, good. Ruth. Ruth. Why Ruth? I like that one. Because she didn't have enough knowledge behind her uh, she, she wasn't a particularly godly woman at the, at the onset, and yet she saw something in Naomi that she just really wanted to latch on to, and, you know, it was just purely, it started off anyway as purely a physical thing. Where you go, I'll go. Her love for her. Right. That's good. And then Job, I, should, I might as well ask, why Job, just out of curiosity, yeah. on surrender? Everything is Yeah. He had to surrender. Still. That's right. That's good. But he chose not to um, throw God away, which is part of the surrender. I don't understand, but okay. That, that's a surrender issue. Who else can we think of surrender? How about Abraham when he's told to go sacrifice his son? Oh, yeah. No. <laughs> you know? Oh, my. I read that story and I just get like cold sweats. You know? That kind of surrender. Moses, for sure. Hmm? Peter, Paul, absolutely. Oh, and with Paul, I had a passage. Acts chapter 20. Look at Acts chapter 20 just for a second. Acts 20, verses 22 and 23. Here's what it says. And now, behold, bound in spirit, I'm on my way to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit solemnly testifies to me in every city, saying... The bonds and afflictions await me. <laughs> you catch what he's saying there? I'm going. Don't know what's going to happen. But God's already told me. The Holy Spirit's told me. I'm, I'm going to get beaten up. But I'm going anyway. That's surrender. You, you know what I'm saying? That's surrender. Do we have anyone in the Bible that was a reluctant surrender bird? Thomas. Thomas. Jonah, that was what I was thinking of. Jonah did not want to go to those people and do what, and it took some drastic measures. He had to go to class. Remember that whole thing? I don't want to go to class. 
I want to learn it on my own. I want to learn it by being obedient to Scripture. So I have to go to class and some of those things. It's a big deal. So here's a question. What are our greatest agendas in life? Just in general. What are our greatest agendas? Let's be real. Let's be really real. What's our greatest agenda? Just in general. In your families, your life, whatever. What are our greatest agendas? Success. Success? Be happy. Be happy? Comfort. Comfort? What did you say? Okay. Financial security. Financial security. <clears throat> Raise good kids. Good health. Be part of a great church. Okay, be, good, be a part of a good church. I'm going to put that in a separate category from where I'm going next. Yeah, absolutely. I want to be part of a great church. That's good. What else? What's our greatest agendas? Self. Self. We want to, you know, be free. We want to be happy. We want to have friends and security, fulfilling experiences, all this. I mean, that's, when we think about life, if we were to really be honest about our agenda, what is our agenda? It would be these things most of the time. And so sometimes, though, these agenda items can conflict with what God's actually calling us to do. Would you agree with that statement? Yes. <laughs> Good. Lots of you do. And that's challenging. Now, uh, that doesn't mean that these things can't happen. That doesn't mean that these things aren't a part of life. Uh, I think the real issue, and when it comes down to surrender, surrender with God means that these agenda items become more of a byproduct, or these agenda items become more of a side benefit, as opposed to the thing we're really living for. And I think for most of us in our culture, even in a Christian culture, we still have sort of the agenda of, I want to be, I want to have money, I want to have happiness, I want to have good stuff, I want to have health and all these things, and that still becomes our greatest agenda, as opposed to I want to serve God with all of me. There have been great theologians in the past who have said things like I want to wear out for Jesus, you know, and we could debate whether that's a good idea or not, but the idea of saying, I want to be completely, 100% in God's will for my life, I want to be following Him. and if those things come, they come because God has blessed me with those things, as opposed to I'm running after those things first and foremost. And, that, and now we begin to see this idea of surrender unfold for us. It comes down to heart. It comes down to perspective. It comes down for what is preeminent in my life. Is it God truly first or is it all this other stuff? And as long as I'm happy, um, you know, wealthy, wise and all that, then I'll take some God on the side. And, and that becomes the issue. It's always a challenge. And that's where we're going. And so the question then is, what does surrender look like? If I say, here's the agenda, but what does it look like? What does it look like? Now, we heard, and I don't think Travis is in here. He's probably out running around out there. But Travis preached yesterday. Let me make sure my computer didn't go to sleep so people watching online can see. Um, Travis told a story yesterday, and I was really glad that he did. But he told a story about their surrender and moving down here from Kansas City. They were basically, the 60-second story is, they were friends of ours in Kansas City. Um, we said, hey, we're going to plan a church, and they were super excited. They were like, hey, we're in. And then later down the road, a few months, I went, oh, and by the way, we're going to move to Cabot, Arkansas. So you want to come? <laughs> and the answer was, no, not at all. And the story that brought them here was eventually a story of surrender, but it was also a story of going, I'm not interested in that. And now we begin to see really that picture probably for most of us in our own lives. Not that you, probably most of you haven't been asked to go move to another state to go be a part of a church plant. But, you know, when you do that kind of stuff, there's no guarantee it's going to work. In fact, a lot of times they don't. Uh, that's how it goes. You know, can you imagine them moving down here and it just... You know, it sinks. That would be terrible, right? But it could have happened. And so, but surrender says, no matter what, I'm willing to go. And that's part of the challenge with surrender is that we've got to understand that true surrender doesn't always go well. Look at Paul as an example. Paul was surrendered more than anyone I see as far as a human, you know, normal human person is concerned. 
But it didn't mean it always went well. Paul surrendered and would go places to do exactly what God told him to, and he'd get the snot beat out of him. And so just because we're surrendered doesn't always mean it goes well. And that's hard. But I'll tell you, for in my own life, um, I would probably say prior to the experience of coming here, and this isn't about me, but just an idea of surrender, and that is I loved safe surrender. Safe surrender. Before we moved down here, you know the kind of deal that I made with God? I'd talk to him and I'd go, okay, I'll go plant a church. I'll give up my good um, pastor job here in Kansas City, a church I can stay all of my life. I'd give up my paycheck and security, give up our family and all that, as long as. Anybody ever done that? I call it safe surrender or conditional surrender. Guess what? That's not surrender. It's just not. The as long as deal is, it, guess what? I hate to tell you this, but it's not in here. Where we go, okay, God, I'll do whatever you want me to do as long as. I just don't see it. And so eventually, uh, I had to come to terms with that. I did. It, it took a while to be able to get to a point where I finally said to God, okay, I give. I'll go anywhere you want me to go, and I'll do anything you want me to do, no conditions. When I did that for the, really the first time, because I was reading this book, I was reading a book, I call it um, The Stupid Book now, but it was a book by Chip Ingram, I'm being a Romans 12 disciple. Guess what? The, and by the way, before we really began the move to start planning a church, everywhere I went, I saw Romans 12. Everywhere. I turn on the radio. You know how, how Travis had a scripture? If you were here yesterday, Travis had a scripture kept popping up all the time. Mine was Romans 12 too. Every time I'd turn around, there'd be like a billboard. They had Romans 12 too on it. Or I'd turn on the radio, Romans 12 too, over and over and over and over again. I pick up this book. A friend says, you need to read this book. By Chip Ingram. Guess what it was? Being a Romans 12 disciple. And I was like, you have got to be kidding me. So I started reading. I think it was page 37. And you know what Chip said? Stupid guy. Can't wait to meet him someday. <laughs> and he said, when it talks about surrender, surrendered living. And he said, if in none of the safe surrender junk. Basically, he explained like how like I did. And he said, if you haven't fully surrendered, stop reading the book. It's a waste of time. You'll get nothing else out of the rest. And I closed the book. And I said, I am not ready. It's fine. And it took weeks. And I could tell the story, and I'm not going to right now. But it took time and prayer and saying, God, I'm scared to say to you, I'll go anywhere and I'll do anything. No exceptions. You know? Until I finally could do it. And finally said, okay God, I mean it. I'll go anywhere and do anything. No exceptions. Um, and if you read in my journal, you'd find that it was very soon after that that I got a phone call from a guy that said, hey, heard about you. Interested in being a church planner? Uh, but it will involve probably moving and all that stuff. Uh, and I don't regret a moment of it. But it's a scary moment of saying, I'll go anywhere do anything. No safety involved. You know, many people have gone to foreign lands. Many people have given up careers. Um, all kinds of things. Because they've surrendered and been still long enough to hear what God had to say. And it's challenging. The other thing that's interesting, I think, about surrender is that it often leads to sacrifice. If you look at another passage... Uh, in the book of Philippians, Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 through 8, you see a piece of this, because of course we can go through all these characters who understood surrender in scripture, knowing that in many cases they're going to get the snot beat out of them, or it's going to be hard. Now by the way, surrender doesn't mean it's always hard, you know, that's the other thing I've got to say and I might forget later. So I want to say, just because you surrender doesn't mean that you just signed up for a life of torture. It's not always that way. Um, but surrender means, okay, God, I'm willing to take whatever you've got because I want the very best from you. Because 
Yeah, it is. It is hard. And so, especially the first time. But you get this like in Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 through 8. It says, Who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, being made in the likeness of men. This is Jesus. This is a picture of surrender, of God taking on flesh and as part of the Trinity, but still being subservient to God the Father. And then being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. For this reason also God highly exalted him, bestowed on him the name which is above every name. So sometimes our surrender leads to sacrifice. And we have to be willing to give up things uh, at times. So um, I was talking to Brandy. Brandy, are you still okay with sharing just for a couple minutes about a story of surrender? Um, talk, you know, we talked yesterday about Travis's, a little bit of mine, but Brandy and I were talking, and so I just want to give her a minute or two, and, or a couple minutes, and maybe could share a story of recent surrender, what that looks like. Nice and loud, though. You can stay there if you want to. Okay. I'll
to think they are what you want because I'm so happy and I'm so just overjoyed. I can be around y'all and I'm happy. I can be by myself and I'm happy. And um, I stopped by practice last night because I had to drop off a few things that I found in my house. And um, Sassy, um, one of our long-time girls, said, I'm so happy for you that I can tell the happiness radiating off of your Facebook page with your post because you just seem like life is going so well for you in the sense that it is. And it just brought me to tears right there because I was like, it is. It's so good. Just the feeling of going, okay, God, you've got control of my life. Finally, I am letting go, and uh, it just it feels so good. I'll never forget all the fun folks that I had with Bernie. Um, but now I have more time for God that I can dedicate, that I want to dedicate. I want to be involved in this church and be involved in my group and just be able to have, to walk down the path that he wants me to walk down. And right now, I kind of had this thought the other day that I don't want to go. <laughs> I just kind of feel like I'm just walking down the road and he'll tell me where to go at some point. Turn left, turn right, keep going straight. Um, but I don't have that fear. That's awesome. Uh, anybody else have a quick story of surrender? Has to be short, though. <laughs> in a couple days, we'll be married for nine years, and I feel like for nine, uh, eight years, God was trying to stick his nose in our relationship the whole time. I mean, you look back on um, it's just science, you know, that we were always fighting for that eight years, you know, eight years, always fighting. And everybody loved us, everybody thought we were a good couple together. We thought that, you know, of course there was something there that made us a good couple. We hated each other at point, you know, I mean, it was bad. God, not going to each other. But really, I mean, he just, he just he never opened up any gates for us to leave each other. And right when it came time that we were open, you know, we took the bolt cutters and started you know, cutting locks off and making way to force to be away from each other. And, uh, it just something moved in me and I, I gave up all control. Uh, I mean, I, I, it's still it's still hard to explain everything that happened that night, but uh, you know, I just gave it all up and Please, please be in control of our relationship now. You know, it's That's all please, I'm please, st please step in. <laughs> we might not have been, we were just <coughs> fighting, you know, working with each other. You know, we just start listening to God. <coughs> My mom would mention, hey, you know, like, you know, you just listen. You know, we're like, whatever, God. She was just all crazy talks as far as I was concerned. <laughs> <laughs> right. it's, amazing, it's amazing that we, we give up control. It really was. I mean, it, it's... When you think you're, you're so hurt and you're so broken and you think, when well, we tried all these other things, there's no way we can get, you know, and then the way that God just fills your heart and moves in your life and when you do give up control and, you know, it just really us that. And he stays on people that he has a problem with. You know, that's very... That's what it looks like, kind of stay, we stay on it. So that felt so right when it was time to give it up. You, know, you, you, you said it before, if you don't know how to pray, just ask like when I wasn't speaking words, but they were words that were just coming through my head as I was praying, you know. I, I knew something was different from that night on, and it's been, you know, been different in some yeah. <laughs> Anybody else? You sure you don't want to try? Okay. All right. <laughs> this is very locked. I've been sober in almost 12 years. Um, that's all I'm sure, but I heard you said, so you pray what you want, and um, <coughs> we gave on to Christ, we gave him all to Christ, um, a friend invited me to a little hole in the wall bar, and we were living, got all dressed up, and hair fixed, on the leather skirt, that was about 60 pounds ago, <laughs> and I looked good, and I felt good, and I went in with the same friend that I party with for probably in the same environment, singing the same songs, and 
I had no reason to leave. Um, but God hit my heart that night, and I knew this is not where God wants me to be. And, and I, it sounds, well, I don't know if any of you have ever had an addiction that you've overcome and God's going through it, and you'll understand this. If you don't, call her out here, I can talk to her wrong. I cried. When I left there, I was like, woo, God, yay. I was like, really, God, this is what I do. I love this. I love this. This is fun. And I knew that it's like, God, I'm going to be with you. And now that was in October 2001. And I've worked in a recovery program ever since then. And God changed my life. I don't want to go to the box. I can't wait. I'm 39 years old. What can I do? I don't want to. That was short, wasn't it? That was really good. Uh, any, one more. Anybody have one more they want to do? And then I'll wrap it up. Yes, Richard? Well, I'm, I'm, one I was thinking of is I was going to a church I thought you were the pastor I had. Yeah. I was sitting in uh, the Sabbath. Corinthians 1, 3, and 4 keep coming to my mind first before I, I had an intent to go here, but let me just say often in these stories of surrender, it's a story about where we've been and where God is leading us and where we need to go. But those stories about where we've been um, can become some of our greatest ministry opportunities as God begins to change our heart and change the way that we see and change the way that we hear and function and walk and move and our perspectives and our priorities as those things change because God is working in us and changing our heart. Sometimes that can become our greatest ministry. You know, it's that 2 Corinthians 1, 3, and 4 talks about how God is the God of comfort who comforts us in our trials, which is the first step of allowing God to do that. And you have to allow Him to, I think. You, know, you have to say, okay, God, I'm ready and I want you to comfort my broken heart. But God is the God of comfort who comforts us in our trials so that we can comfort others with that same comfort that God gave us. That our greatest trials and our greatest struggles and our greatest challenges or greatest addictions to overcome or whatever it is can become our greatest ministries when we're operating with this new uh, transformed heart and mind as God does that work in us. And it's important. And so although rights and privileges and pleasures and possessions and expectations may not be wrong in and of themselves. That's important. Some of the things that we enjoy may not be wrong in and of themselves, but we must learn to hold them loosely and be willing to let them go. I think that's the issue. That the things that we enjoy in life so much, we, we do. We have to hold them loosely. And if God calls us and tells us it's time to let that go, we've got to be willing to let it go. And that's hard to do. But it all comes down to perspective. Am I seeking all of this as my prime directive in life? Or am I seeking God as my prime directive? And then I'm going to be in a position where He'll bless me in different ways. It may not always bless me the way I want. That's where that name and claim it gospel goes so sideways. That every, they assume that you know if you just want to be rich, God will make you rich if you're just faithful enough. Baloney is not how the Bible reads. Now, there will be people that will have plenty of money. Um, if he chooses to allow those blessings to happen. But it, that creates its own challenges. But the reality is, what's my perspective and what's my focus? And so we've got to hold loosely those things and be willing to let them go. That applies in any area, even with our kids. You know, I thought, as I was thinking through this this afternoon, I thought, what is the one area that I would struggle the most with holding loosely and letting go of? It would be my children. It would be my children. Uh, I could let go of... Most other things, I think. But see, that's the challenge, you know, until you get to that moment where it's like, hey, guess what? It's time. <gasps> You're asking me to give up what? <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. There would be kids. And so, and I'm not talking about letting them, you know, um, go off and run off the cliff. That's not what I'm talking about. But, you know, Hannah 
who's 13, she's always had a missionary heart. She just does. And she said many times, even from itty bitty, like, I want to go to another country and teach people about Jesus. She used to say that all the time, which is itty bitty. And there was a part of me that would, inside, that was like, that's awesome, but please don't actually do that. You know, in my head, that second part wouldn't come out loud. It'd be like, oh, that's so good, Hannah. I'm so proud of that. That would be awesome. And inside, I'm going, oh, God, please don't let her go to another country. I've seen too many movies, read too many books. <laughs> you know, into the sphere, whatever. You know, please, no, pick something else. Don't you want to be a doctor? I'll help you. You know, we'll work through it. We'll do some good biology classes. You know, that would be much better. You know, you don't got to go over there. Those are the inside things. But, you know, if your kid really came to you and said, uh, by the way, I'm going to go be a missionary. I'm going to move to a region of the world that they don't even have spoken language. And I'm going to figure out their language. And I'm going to translate the Bible. And I'm going to spend my life teaching them about Jesus. Would we be thrilled? But would I be surrendered? That, that's the kind of thing. And if I could get through that one, I could probably get through the rest of it. You know what I'm saying? You pick that word from one and go, could I do with these, deal with these things? And again, that's not always the case. God doesn't always ask us to do those things. The question is, do I hold loosely the things that I value the most? And would I be willing to give it up if God really asked me to? And it's hard. It's super hard. And the reality is it's different for every one of us. And so the last passage of Scripture I just want to come back to is Romans 12, which is our passage for renew. Romans 12, starting at verse 1, says, Therefore, okay, so anytime there's a therefore, that means something before it happened, and therefore, now this, right? And so really what we've got in Romans is the first 11 chapters are important. It's the reality of the mercies of God. The first 11 chapters are telling us about God's plan for how to deal with sinful men and all those things. Those first 11 chapters, and then we get the big word, therefore. So we understand sinful man, we understand Christ, we understand what he's done, we understand you know, all these things, therefore. Now what? Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. There's our word worship. And we talked about that. It comes from Old English, meaning worship, saying that God is worthy. So saying that God is worthy in worship, what does it look like? It's presenting my body as a living and holy sacrifice. Remember what I said earlier? That surrender often leads to sacrifice. That doesn't mean sacrificing my life on a cross necessarily, although there are scriptures that talk about being willing to take up your cross, and that could mean all kinds of things. But it is saying, I am sur surrendered so fully that it's a sacrifice acceptable to God. And then the last part of that surrender is don't be conformed to the world. Literally, don't let the world shove you into its box, but be transformed. Metamorpheo is the Greek word, just like a caterpillar to a butterfly. That caterpillar had the DNA to become a butterfly all the while. But that DNA didn't express itself until a point in time when it was time to become the butterfly. But that transformation is metamorphosis, that switch from one thing into what it was always intended to be. You know, that's the thing about a caterpillar. Even though it's a caterpillar, it was always intended to be a butterfly or a moth. But there's a certain point when that switch is turned on. And now we realize or live out what it was always intended to be. That caterpillar was never intended to just be a caterpillar and stay there. It was intended to always be a butterfly. And so it is being transformed, that metamorpheo, by the renewing of your mind, changing the way you think, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. And that's what it is. It's that surrender. Now, and I've said, it's my joke. I've said it on Monday nights probably 20 times. I'll continue to say it because I think it's hilarious. <laughs> and because I'm the guy that's talking, I'll say it again. <laughs> I think it's funny. You better laugh. I'm just saying. And that is, uh, the problem with a living sacrifice is what? See, uh -huh. it keeps crawling off the altar. What does that mean? It's important. A living sacrifice doesn't stay dead. It means tomorrow i got to kill this thing too. And the next day, and the next day, and the next day. The surrender often is an ongoing process. It's not like a one time, okay, I said the magic prayer. I'm all good. And instead, it is every day, every moment, 
I'm living out the implications of this transformed life and going, God, I, I surrender. Now, here's good news. When you really become surrendered, it gets easier over time. But often, we get te tested, tempted to not stay surrendered. Would you agree? In certain areas in our life. The question is, will I be a living sacrifice? Paul says, I die daily. That is, to do my own thing. I don't want to do my thing. I want to go God's way. Which is part of our definition of repentance, by the way. Of not continue to go my way, but go God's way. And so we have all these great scriptures. Romans 12, Luke 9 talks about Jesus saying, if you want to be my disciple, again, you've got to deny yourself. 1 Corinthians 8 talks about, you know, even things like, if you're going to eat food that's causing a brother to stumble, you've got to stop it. You know, it's in simple things like that, and that's surrender. Matthew 11, 29 Take my yoke upon you. Burden is easy. The yoke is light. Take it upon you. You know, those kinds of things. That's an issue of surrender when we're struggling in life. And Jesus offers surrender. Under our surrender offers rest. That's good news, don't you think? And so that's what surrender begins to look like in our lives. Um, now for you, to bring it home, I guess, the last thing I'll say is... Your surrender is different than probably other people that are sitting around you. Each of us have different places in life that we need to surrender. There's probably areas right now, all of you know, that it, it's time to give that up or to go a different way or to surrender this and that. You know, you've heard that still small voice of God saying, I need you, I want you to go this way. And is he doing it because he's mean and he hates you and wants to beat you up? No, he's doing it because he knows what's best for you. My ways and my thoughts are higher and better than yours, God says. And so to hear that prompting and say, I'm willing to surrender and go God's way. And, you know, like Travis said yesterday, seek counsel. If you think you hear of something, seek counsel. Counsel. Search the scriptures. Pray, 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 pray. And seek what out, out what God is really calling you to do. But the first place I want to tell you to start is pray. Ask God to reveal the areas in your life that need to be surrendered. That's a heart. Ask God to tell you. Ask God, show me, Father, where I have areas that are holding me back. A passage in Psalm 139. If you're a note taker, you can write this down. Psalm 139, verses 23 and 24. Um, I love it. It says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. That's Psalm 139, 23 and 24. Before I study and pray, often, not always, often, that's my prayer. God, I want to come into your presence, but first I pray this prayer, and that is search me, know my anxious thoughts, show me the places in my life that I've gone sideways. See if there's any offensive way. See if there's anything that holds me back that's in between you and me. Reveal it to me so I can get that out of it. It's a good prayer. Or how about Psalm 119 and 18? Open my eyes that I may see the wonderful things written in your law or in your word. Which would lead us to the second place. Pray, ask God, reveal the areas of my life that I need to surrender. Or reveal the areas of my life that I'm not surrendered to you. And then search the scripture and see. The last thing I'll say it was an issue of surrender and that is um, years ago uh, I, I, I've told you before I, I have, in the past I have had a slight car addiction I love cars I've had several sports cars and muscle cars and all that good stuff I don't anymore. I have a Jeep that has 150,000 miles on it and a Kia so I think we've worked past it <laughs> and so um, I went out and, you know, Jennifer has been a wonderful wife to me and allowed me to make some stupid decisions. And I went out to uh, go buy another sports car. This was, again, this was years ago. And went and made the deal. was so thrilled about it. And it was the fastest, best car I would have ever had. That thing would just melt your face. And I've had some cars melt your face. This was the top of melt your face car. And I was so excited, but they didn't have it because I wanted the super melt in your face, so I had to order the car. And so it wasn't there. We are going to be there for three or four days. So I made the deal, signed on the dotted line, went home, so excited, couldn't wait to get in my melt your face car. And I, so I sat down to start doing some Bible reading, and I came to the book of Ecclesiastes. 
because it was interesting. I, was, I got home, I was so excited. And the moment I walked in the door, I started feeling guilty. And I thought, oh, did I really need to do that? But it's too late. I'm already in, committed. But, oh, I feel bad about it. I could use that money for other things and, you know, do this and that, whatever. Do I really need to You know, I'm going through all that. And that's when I thought, I need to search the scriptures and see what God has to say. And I don't always recommend what I'm about to say, so don't take this as this is the way you always do it. But I just sort of flipped the Bible open and was just kind of curious what God might have to say to me. And I opened up right to the book of Ecclesiastes, which begins with, all of it is vanity. <laughs> and I went, oh no! That was loud and clear. I didn't need the thundering voice from heaven. I read it right there in the scripture. That was the it was. But I didn't need to hear it with my ears. I read it when I made a mistake. I got on the phone and called my I got bad news. I'm not buying that car. Uh, that was an issue of surrender. That's not a good me story. In fact, that's a bad me story. But it is a story that says, I want to be in God's will. And I need to pray and to search scripture and see what God's telling me. Your issues of surrender are different than mine. They just are. But surrender is important. So, I'm going to pray and finish up there. I, had, I really thought, in my best guess, based on the very small amount of notes that I had tonight, I really thought I'd have time to handle other questions, but I was wrong. <laughs> so, uh, we handled this topic. I hope it was useful to you. I hope it does something. I want you to wrestle with it. I want you to chew on it, because it's a hard one, but it's an important one. And again, don't, you don't have to fight this on your own. Seek godly counsel from people. Don't just go ask anyone. Don't go, hey, Bob, I know you don't love Jesus or anything, but what do you think about this? Is that okay if I keep doing that? Don't, you know, you, you're smart. All of you are. If you want to get an answer, you know who to call and you can get that answer. You know what I'm saying? I mean, that, it's kind of like statistics. You can make statistics of any way you want if you just do the numbers right. So I'm not talking about just calling anyone and go, hey, what do you think about this? I was thinking about giving this up. What do you think? Instead, seek godly counsel. Pray. Ask God. Reveal to me the areas of my life I'm not surrendered to. You. Although you might already know. And it may be more than one, which is really challenging. But God, show me where I'm not surrendered. Show me where I'm, I'm not in your will. Show me where I need to make some changes. Because I'm all in. No safe surrender. I want to be in. I want to do what you want me to do. I know your best is way better than what I can dream of. Uh, because he's God. So I want exactly what he wants from me. Even though it might be hard. Even though it might be a struggle. Sometimes, not always. Don't freak out on me. Don't sit there and go, oh no, my life's going to go downhill if I pray this prayer. And go, God, I'm surrendered. I want to do whatever you want. God could do that anyway. You know, it's just an issue of being surrendered and going, God, I want to do exactly what you want me to do. I'm willing to give up whatever. or No safe surrender stuff. I'm all in. It starts there. You may not be able to pray that prayer tonight. But I want to challenge you with it. Let you chew through it. Ask godly counsel. Pray. And read your Bible. Go and search the scriptures. See what God says. Because I think if you're His, you go to the scripture and you look, He'll reveal. He will. He'll reveal to you where you need to go. And what you need to do. And show you the path that you need to go. I'm still on that journey. I always will be. Always will be. The things I work on surrendering are totally different than they were when I accepted Christ 20 years ago. Totally different. Um, my surrender stories are totally different now than they were five years ago. They are. It changes. Um, and that's what happens because part of surrender and sacrifice is an issue of maturing and growing up in your walk with Christ. Just like Paul said, he wanted to present each one mature in Christ. That's my hope for you too. That's why we're talking about it. So I'm proud of you for being here. I know it's a hard topic. Don't be depressed about it. But pray. Pray and seek God out. On behalf of my family, thanks for surrendering to that part of your life. And yeah. moving down here and planting the church. Hey, I'm thrilled. Show us what love and surrender we got. But you know, yes, and I'm thrilled that the surrender brought us here. I really am. But in the beginning, it was the scariest thing. And I wept and wept and wept. Almost like the sacrifice of your family. You know, yeah. Very happy. Yeah. But here we are. And I couldn't imagine not being here. And that's the thing is when you say, okay, God, I'm going to trust you even though I don't see it. Uh, which is really what faith is. Um, 
faith and hope. It's like I don't see over the brick wall, but I know what's on the other side. And that's part of it. So let me pray, and then we'll finish up. God, thank you for um, challenging us tonight. I know this is probably one of the most challenging topics that we've dealt with on a Monday night. But I pray that each one here tonight will be in a place where they seek you out truly and say to you, Father, reveal to me the areas of my life that I'm not surrendered. And then I pray that we'll have the strength to surrender fully, that we'll say that we're all in. We'll go wherever you want us to go and do what you want us to do with no claws in there, no safety net, but that we'll be surrendered. And I pray that in that, Father, as we do surrender, that you'll bless us in amazing ways, that we'll see your hand of uh, your gentle hand and your hand of providence and blessing in our life as we seek to follow. And that we'll do whatever it is you call us to do. And so, I, Father, I pray that you'll drive us to our scriptures, that you'll remind us to pray and to come into your presence always. And so, Father, I praise you for tonight. I praise you for what you've done already. I know you've done amazing things in the lives of many who are here tonight. And I pray that you continue to do it, that they will see and I will see your beautiful touch as you move us and as you change our hearts and transform our minds to be more in tune with you. We praise you for it all. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I love you. Last thing, if you have an offering you want to give and put it in the box, there's a box right there. Otherwise, I'll hang out. We can chit-chat or whatever. Open the doors. Go eat more cookies and coffee. And I'm glad you're here. Jason. I just wanted to wish my wonderful wife a happy Oh, that's right. Happy birthday, Stacy. Let's see. Happy 29th birthday. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, to you. Happy birthday dear Stacy. Happy birthday to you. Thanks for coming to church on your birthday. Oh, there you go. A lot better than I used to sound like that.